sell them. Obviously, it's the first meeting. Successful when we went to fight it. You're recording. <laughs> um, I'd like to welcome everyone to our first meeting. I'm Scott Harrington. I'm the sixth ward council member. Uh, we're the liaison for our uh, commission here. Um, just a couple things uh, before we get going here. Um, <clears throat> I, I'm kind of excited about this, and I think a lot of people on the council are excited about this. Um, I know my predecessor, Russ Souther, was on the council and was really looking uh, hard at this. This is something that's been going on for many, many years uh, to look at our housing and how we can better um, position the city for um, growth and and getting new people to come in. Um, I just want to make sure, has everybody gotten the emails from our city clerk with all the paperwork and uh, what the charter, uh, <clears throat> what our ordinance is, and have you guys had time to, to look that over? And if there's any questions about it, we can try it a little bit later. Um, I know Greg Matice and Judy Payman are here, and we're going to be going over a bunch of stuff that's also been sent to you. Um, if you ever want anything in uh, paper form, um, just reach out to the city clerk and she'll make sure it's ready for you. And it'll be up here for you uh, so that you can have it uh, for yourselves. Um, I don't know how many of you have said on, I mean, I know uh, Ed May has, Danny has, and uh, have run uh, meetings before I know Russ was as the uh, former deputy mayor there for a while <clears throat> running things so um, at any time you have any questions on point of order and stuff there's people in the room that can help answer questions for you so with that um, I don't know everybody um, I know a fair amount of you um, but let's uh, We'll just uh, go down through our roll call and see who is here. If the clerk could please call the roll for me. Commissioner Benjamin? Here. Commissioner Friedman? Here. Commissioner Lappin? Here. Commissioner May? Here. Commissioner Shu? Here. Commissioner Southard? Here. Councilmember Harrington? Here. Councilmember, correction, Commissioner Fox has indicated she will not be in attendance at tonight's meeting. Would it, you know, the next thing on our agenda is the organizational, which would be a nominations of the election of a, of a chair. Um, would it be helpful first if we went around the room and had our commissioners introduce each other and uh, give a little bit of background or how would you guys like to do it? I'm gonna start with Mr. Southern, going around the room that way. Sure. Okay. Mr. Southern. Uh, Russ Southern, um, former uh, six ward councilman, now retired. Um, built a new house in the city and formerly owned rental properties, which I'm about five years removed now. But um, so I have done a little bit of uh, everything as far as housing. Elected to build a new house in the city. That's not that, uh, you know, common. Not that common, is it? No. Nope. You done, Russ? Yes. Yeah, All right. My name is Ed May. I've been involved with the city and city government since 1970 in various capacities. Uh, own and operates about 32 properties in the city and several businesses. Currently serve on three commissions here in the city. Jared Shu, uh, born and raised in Oneonta, registered architect, uh, my first um, commission, and I'm excited to, to work with everybody. Um, I'm Danny Lappin. I am uh, the chair of the City of Oneonta Planning Commission. I'm a nationally certified planner uh, with the Otsego County Conservation Association, my day job and my specialty is in long-range community planning and environmental review. 
Um, I also serve as the uh, county representative serving only on awards five and six on the county board. Um, I regularly assist communities throughout the Mohawk Valley with policy issues around comprehensive planning, zoning compliance, housing, etc. cetera, um, for my day job. So happy to be here and how honored to serve. Uh, my name is Peter Friedman. I worked as the city code enforcement officer for 25 years until uh, 2008. I'm on the zoning board and uh, I've built a few houses. Um, I'm Audrey Benkenstein, and given some of the reports of past council meetings, my name is known, but maybe not my face. I work for Opportunities for Otsego, and for the last three-ish years, three-plus years, I've worked with Judy Pangman on housing issues in the city of Oneonta. Um, my position with um, OFO is Housing and Community Development Director. Um, looking for opportunities to increase housing primarily for people of low income, um, stable housing for people of low income, um, but have expertise in working with people of all incomes to obtain housing. Okay, um, with that, uh, is there anybody like to make a nomination for the chairman of the committee? Yes. I'd like to nominate Danny Leapin. Is there a second for that nomination? I'll second it. We have a nomination and a second for the chair of the committee to be Danny Lappin. Could you please call the roll? Commissioner Benkenstein? Aye. Commissioner Fong? Friedman? Yes. Commissioner Lappin? Abstain. Commissioner May? Aye. Commissioner Shu? Yes. Commissioner Southard? Aye. Motion passes. With that, my official duties are over. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm honored to be uh, receive your trust to help run this commission as chairman. Um, my door is always open. I'm, you know, I enjoy. I think the city finds its strength in bottom-up grassroots collaboration to share ideas. We're not as big as other communities, but I think that our collective spirit and work ethic makes us a truly competitive community in the realm of long-range planning. So I'm all, my door's always open. I look forward to working with you all. Um, and so I guess we can start with uh, correspondence. Has there been any correspondence? No correspondence. Okay, so then now um, we can move on to uh, new business. I believe um, Ms. Pangman has a number of agenda items to share with us. families, for rentals, and in the city they were able to 
obtain a few houses, but they have a lot of trouble getting access and uh, site control of houses. So they ended up doing a combination of rehabs and building new. Um, and it's a pretty successful project that uh, we're pretty proud of. Um, the funding for the Housing Visions projects ended up being similar to what is in use here on the lots on Deep Street, which were low-income housing tax credits. Um, the city also was able to get a CDBG grant for that project. In the case of the Los on Deep Street, which I've Actually, I'll just skip to because I just started talking about it. Um, that project also got some of our DRI money um, to help with the, the construction. Um, Lost on Deeds will end up with over 60 new housing units for low and moderate income people. Um, the city in the past has also offered tax exemptions. But currently, when they did that, we limited it to two years, I believe. And in order to reinstate that, it would require council approval and then uh, state legislative approval as well. But that's something that we found worked in the past. Um, it, it might pay to go back and take a look at how well that worked and maybe consider that again. Um, in the past, we have been able to purchase properties, houses off the county tax list prior to it going to the auction. Um, we, did, we used to, we had, we had two houses that we were able to successfully purchase off the county tax list, turn over to OFO, and then OFO worked on them with a first time home buyers program that the city was able to buy, um, to rehab them, but to also allow uh, first time home buyers that were low income to purchase the homes as well. Uh, so that was a pretty good program. Um, the, we currently are working with the land bank, Stephen, and I hope you can update me. I was on the on the board of directors for that until January when Stephen um, took over that spot. Um, the land bank has targeted to do three projects in the city. They completed one, which was purchasing a home on Cherry Street. Um, and demolishing it, and then selling the lot, and then the other two projects are slated to be rehabbed, or possibly one rehab and one we, demolition. No, so we have one that we are hoping to do a rehab on, and the second one would be a uh, stabilization with sales scope to a purchaser who agreed to do particular improvements to the property. So that's in the works right now. Um, I mentioned lots on Heat Street. We are currently working on a downtown improvement fund for upper floor housing. We have four or five projects of upper floor housing, but the main one is Springbrook, which is going to bring over 20 units of, of uh, second and third floor housing units for moderate income people um, on the Ford Block building. And then we have a couple of other projects in that, which will bring a handful. Mm -hmm up to four or five new units as well. So between that and the Los Angeles Street, we're going to have close to 100 new units in the downtown. Um, some of the grants that my office has been working on since I started, I started in 2016. And we were just finishing up a first-time homebuyers pro program when I started that um, allowed seven new homeowners to purchase homes and rehab them. And that was for a total of $300,000. And then we had um, two rental rehab programs that fixed up uh, a total of 14 homes with a total of um, 43 units for $650,000. And then more recently, we just fixed up 11 single family homes with a total of $814,000. Um, and those were all for low or very low income um, owner occupied homes. We've currently applied for another first time home buyers program. And we also just applied for a CDBG grant for a housing conditions survey. And if we get that grant, I'm really excited about that because 
we'd be able to go out and look at homes throughout the city, maybe not every single one, um, but a number of them, and determine what the conditions are. And then I'm hoping that this commission can take a look at that data and make some plans for you know what we can target to resolve in that. So that's where we currently are with our housing um, programs. Um, I guess I'll open the floor for any questions from the commissioners. Yes. Um, Commissioner Friedman. Um, who is administering these um, uh, rehabilitations of houses, uh, both the rentals and the single family? I guess the single family were owner occupied, right? Um, OFO did the administration for the single family, the, the last two grants, which were for owner occupied single family. Um, prior to that, and OFO has administered our first time home buyers program in the past. And then the two rental rehab programs um, that were like midway through and then had parked um, before I got here. Um, and then when I came on, um, we were just rolling out the DRI at that point. So that went um, to Delaware Opportunities and they administered those two grants because they had experience for those two and could jump in and continue them. For this commission, are those addresses uh, uh, available for us? The addresses? Of all of those properties? Yeah, I can, I can get them. I would like to, to see all of that. I just want to see how successful we've been at spending our money and if we're being effective. I think that um, if you wouldn't mind sharing with us, you went over a series of grants, a number of units rehab and the grant amount. If you, if it's not too much trouble, could you please um, share a spreadsheet with that, that information to us so that we see it? I think it'd be beneficial to have um, for promo you know, promotional purposes and also to aid in our understanding of um, your office. Uh, do any of the other commissioners have questions? Yeah, when you put together that spreadsheet, could you include uh, approximate dates that the, the work was done? Go ahead. Um, the, uh, you, you mentioned the two-year tax exemptions. Um, how, does, how does that work? Uh, it's, there's no tax exemption after the two years? That was done before I got here, and it ended before I got here, so I don't have any details on that. I'd have to, we'd have to find them. And Gary's been talking to um, uh, Mr. Maxwell about those as well. Uh, but I know that when they were enacted, they were enacted during um, Bill Miller's time, Mary Miller, and um, they put a two-year time limit on them to see how they went, and then they didn't get extended after that. So now, since they're no longer um, active, they would have to be they would have to be completely re. So, so that would yeah. that would require a home rule measure, then, wouldn't it? Or would we be able to issue our own? No, I, I believe it. From what Gary had said yesterday, it requires council approval, and then it requires approval by the state legislature. Oh, okay. Okay. Was, was that an exemption or just a freeze at what the property was before they fixed it up? I don't have what they Because I thought it was, they, did, they wouldn't get reassessed right away. It was an incentive to fix them up and not get hammered right away. I thought it, they paid taxes, but it was what it was when they bought the property. Yeah, I don't I don't have them. So, and, yeah, and Gary didn't have them either. So, Frank, do you, have you seen them? Look back probably find that, but I haven't seen it in, since it happened. So. I know they were on one of the old, old websites. They were linked to it, so, but I don't know. They're on the are. Department of State website, and we have copies in the clerk's office. Uh, they were done by local B. law. What did you say? 485B. The state enabling legislation still exists, and it's up to the individual underlying municipalities to either join or not at their whim. I think Maxwell could tell you who took advantage of it and how much it cost. Uh, the reason they put it up with a two-year sunset was they, they weren't sure the impact it would have on the city budget. That would be interesting. Maybe we can, uh, um, if you could ask um, Mr. Maxwell about that. And um, I think that that would be worth looking at too. But then that requires 
coordination across multiple departments. Do any other commissioners have questions for Ms. Pangman? Um, if there are none, I have one. Um, I think considering this commission, well, dealing, you know, housing policy cuts across multiple city departments. I think it'd be worth at a future meeting discussing how housing projects are coordinated across the city government. So like if there's a large funding application and they get it, how do all the departments coordinate with one another to deliver the final product? And then from the legislative side, if there's a change in housing policy, how is that, you know, how is that kind of put through the various city committees, just so that everybody who's not like actively involved in the city government knows how everything works, like a flow chart or a presentation of some kind, I think that would be helpful. Cause in my mind, you know, thinking about all the programs that you mentioned, um, Judy, is that I'm like thinking of like, okay, which department in the city does what, how, what level of communication is there, how are things coordinated? And that's something that I, you know, uh, as an outside person, I don't know. And so like, I, I think it'd be helpful to learn. Well, I could answer right now about grants. So if we get a housing grant, I administer it. And if I need any assistance from the other departments, I go to the other departments. Like if we need police approval, I go to Stephen, and then we work on that together. Uh, and then the financial end, I, any financial, you know, drawdown request or anything like that, I go through the um, finance department. And if I have to do an RFP or anything for consultant, I go through our purchasing department who handles that. But it's basically me. And then, you know, and I get the help I need. Go ahead. The, um, the, the properties that are uh, listed for auction by the county, I guess, um, how is that, uh, how does that process work? Who, who looks at the list and says, we want these properties? Is that done by OFO or by the city? That would be by the city. Um, and that isn't a standard, typical thing that we do. Um, I, I have done it all, uh, for the past few years because of the land bank. Um, you know, but if we had a fund where we were looking to purchase those properties, then it would become a thing where I'd be calling the county to find out what's on there and they would keep me updated. Can, can that list be given to us, the, the properties that are on the um, auction at this time or expect to be soon? Yeah, I would so. I, so I have that list. You have list. I can provide you the list okay. of what the county has right now. That'd be great. Um, but those can change. I mean, someone could pay the taxes and mm -hmm. lose sure. the fees. And, mm -hmm. and the, uh, the land bank, uh, how does that work? So, so the land bank has funding, and it determines across a pretty large geographical area how it's going to allocate funding to do projects. Um, I know right now, uh, I kind of vocalize that Otsego County has been, I don't want to say shafted, but kind of not... Um, we only have one project and it was a demolition. So the land bank is pretty firmly committed that if we can pull two properties off the, the uh, county tax option, that we would do two projects here in the city going out. Um, the land bank would kind of have first shot at those properties uh, before they're generally optioned. Um, but again, that comes down to those properties might be taken off, you know, and. The right. owner might belly up and pay the taxes. I mean, so so the land bank looks at the list, or we look at the list and say we'd like you to take these properties, and then they pass those properties to opportunities for Etsigo. Is that, is that no? The, no. Land, the land bank's a separate entity. That program was years ago that mm -hmm. the city did that with OFO, but that's separate from what the land bank does. Right. Another thing about the land bank, which we're a little disappointed about, maybe more than one was. Taking properties off the tax auction is low paying for you know, anybody to do that. Right. The land bank's mission was supposed to break through getting access to properties nobody can get access to, and that's not what they're doing. So, right. you know, to get projects done, we're going along with this. We've been taking off, off the auction just so we can get some of the projects done in the city here. Um, but it's really not what their, what their role is supposed to be. 
Yeah, so th there was some funding for um, zombie type properties and vacant housing property or vacant properties. Um, what that's kind of turned into is the city of Omeana has a pretty thorough list already. We keep a database, we do inspections. We kind of ended up just providing models for the land bank to use for other communities. Um, so yeah, like Judy said, the, the auction thing is kind of a, we're kind of taking what we can get. I'm not gonna turn down um, you know, rehab on a vacant property that someone else is gonna do. Um, but yeah, they're not, we're not, the land bank isn't gonna come in and buy 10 houses and turn them over in two days. They don't have the manpower or the money or just the technical capabilities. So they're not, they're not getting at some of our more problem properties, but we're taking what, what they can do. So is there already thought about the city taking the properties back from the auction directly? Well, that was done in the past. Um, if there are funding um, available to do that, or if, if that's a recommendation by the commission, that's something that council could look at today. And, and do it now. I know Gary and I went to uh, Cooperstown, and one was on Gilbert. I can't remember the second one, and we asked him not to put it in the auction. And that was the OFO mm -hmm. program. Right. Again, the county has to agree to that as well. I mean, the county right. has to is part of that process. I, I, I'm just, I, I don't want to belabor this because this is the first meeting we're having, but uh, if if the city chose to not, uh, 30 years ago the city auctioned properties themselves. And they didn't go to the county. Can we still do that? I guess I'd just like to know sometime in the future, not, not necessarily now. But I think that's a good question to have uh, our city attorney here for, you know, yeah. ask. The tech yeah. Peter, I just want to throw out, there's two properties that I could, I could list as a cautionary tale for that process. 38 Cedar is one that the city uh, sold to someone with an agreement that they would improve it. It's now a caved-in vacant house that I live next door to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And 50 Elm Street is another one that the land bank is looking to take. Yeah. But and that's another one that had a some sort of weird agreement with repairs and. But it's it's my understanding that with I don't know what happened with 50 Elm, but that with 38 Cedar that it was the city that failed to enforce their contract of sale. And so, I mean, as as a group here. Uh, if that's what we decided we needed to do, we could be checking with the city attorney, like Danny's saying, to find out what we would have to do to be able to enforce contracts of sale that required that the property be restored I in two years or so. I believe Commissioner, I mean, Councilman Risberger has a uh, question or a statement. I've got a little bit of history about that because that, that conversation has come up at Council and Russell remember this too. Um, according to uh, our um, Dave Merzig, the only way to go back to us actually um, auctioning off homes is if we stop allowing the county to make us whole on properties that are not paying their taxes. Because what happens now is they make us whole, so they have the opportunity to then auction these properties off. If we want to go back, Every time I brought it up to, to Dave about going back to the way the city used to, he's, he's very hesitant to, to do that because it's, it's a lot of work. Um, but if that's something that this committee feels is absolutely necessary to move us forward um, and break this housing log jam that we have, um, you know, I, I, would, I think the council would, would uh, absolutely listen to any recommendation, including that one. Thanks. Um, are there, uh, Mr. Yearly? Um, off of what Dave said, I would include in that question um, whether property maintenance uh, levies would then, would we still be made whole on those? Because a large part of what the code enforcement office does is we levy uh, fees against properties that fail to like remove garbage, mow their lawns, and shovel snow. And I know that the counties, the power to auction is, is their ability to rec you know, collect that money that they give us for those maintenance functions. So I would want to make sure that that's part of the discussion as well. 
be clear, I'm, I'm not sure what you're saying, to be sure that if um, the city took it, we would still be able to. If the county's not making us whole, yeah. are they not making us whole on all those fees as well? What are they doing now? They're, they're cutting us a large check at yeah. the end of the year for all that property. Including the fees. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, water and sewer bills as well. So water and sewer bills as well. Okay. And I know that, like Dave said, part of the function of the county is they have the ability to, to foreclose an auction, so they can make themselves whole after paying us. So I just want to make sure that we wouldn't lose any of those functions. Yeah. Are there any other um, questions or comments, um, Ms. Pangman? Thank you for your time. We appreciate it. Um, so I kind of uh, skipped an agenda item. There was one of the organizational items that um, merits discussion is the discussion is basically to go over the charge of our commission and discuss it. And I just wanted to open the floor. Um, you should have all received a, um, a copy of the ordinance number one of 2021, which kind of um, establishes our powers as a commission. Um, hopefully you've all reviewed it um, and I just wanted to see what everyone's thoughts were, um, what they um, believe to be you know, some of the priority items that we should address as a commission because housing is so broad it's easy to get lost in several different directions. So I, you know, I think that in order to maintain our efficiency and effectiveness as a group we need to kind of pick and choose priority items and kind of knock, one off, knock them off as they come along. Um, so I just want to open the floor. Uh, for discussion, Commissioner Friedman. Well, I, I think there's a diversity of opinion on on the, in the group. I'm sure there is, and so uh, I think that maybe in a, a brief session we should cover all the possibilities, and then narrow it down rather than pick one and move with it because we might get tired. Okay. So, like at a future meeting we can kind of discuss some of the housing we can like review the 2013 strategy and then the 2017 plan come up with some you know a discussion a broad discussion of housing issues facing the city and just get them all listed and kind of like a I can bring like a easel on a paper we can just kind of write stuff down and brainstorm things and then that meeting I'd invite members of the council or you know city staff to share their ideas too because they're you know have the kind of on the ground perspective that uh, that would be valuable or the perspective from City Hall I should say too um, so that would be good and I also I think it's um, again it, it comes the, the issue of housing in my opinion um, it's there's like several different sides there's the private side there's like the land there's a side view from the resident there's kind of the city planning side and uh, housing finance side there's so many different aspects so I think that kind of broad approach is a good thing I agree with Commissioner Friedman's suggestion. Um, so, does anybody else have any other comments on the charge of the commission, or is it all well understood? Okay, hearing none. So, oh sure. Um, one of the one of the reasons why I'm excited about this, and I don't know about my fellow council members out there, is. Everything that we do as a council really affects housing. Whether it's when we sit down and we're debating our taxes and what we should do for roads or what we should do for uh, parks and stuff like that. So I'm hoping that some of that gets filtered into, you know, um, when you're looking at housing, what, what we can do to make affordable housing as well. Uh, because our housing is also going to help bring in businesses. So this this one area here, that's why I said is you know besides zoning and planning, this is the next biggest thing because it's going to have the most impact. And one of the things I was I was going to throw out there because I'm sure our city manager can make this happen is if you guys would like to, we can maybe get uh, one of our buses and we can go through the neighborhoods and just look at how they're all built each ward is completely different you know the sixth ward has two gateways coming into the city you know and center city has different needs than what the sixth ward needs which is different than the fifth ward 
you know, so I think maybe that'd be more uh, that could be beneficial to go through and look at how the, how they're set up and what what are we seeing, what might we we might be able to do something with Steve Yearly with codes real quick if you know we see overgrowing trees or something like that that could be part of maybe this commission a little bit to help try to clean up um, you know just just some ideas for. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of a, a bus tour because um, as we consider moving the city's zoning code towards like a form-based code that focuses a lot on architecture and site design, it's important that as a commission we get an idea of those kind of characteristics as they pertain to housing. So, so I'm, kind of, I'm very interested in that. I think um, one of the things that I would like to see is the is to take the 2013 plan and the 2017 plan and figure out exactly what has been done and what hasn't been done. What, how much progress have we made towards certain recommendations? Uh, what have we missed? And then also I wanna see kind of what gaps in information that folks think are missing. Um, if you're a home from the perspective of a landlord or the perspective of a buyer or perspective of a planner or city staff or elected official, what kind of information do we feel is missing or is not as accessible as it should be, because I think, from what my understanding, just in my, in, you know, in my realm, is that a lot of information on housing in the cities in many different places among many different agencies, a lot of people are doing different things. So it'd be important to kind of figure out what's going on, where all the uh, data are, where how they're being shared, and kind of um, take a look at you know organizing that data into a, into kind of a cohesive. I like guess database or site or somewhere to where we as commissioners can access it readily and under and like kind of digest it because if we're going to be making recommendations to the council, I think the importance of having data behind our recommendations can't be understated. Um, to that point, I think um, we've had several what I consider to be good housing projects um, proposed to the city over the last three or four decades, uh, five of them, I think. And they all failed because of our process. We have a process that's designed to prevent housing, I believe. And so I think what we need to do is look at what failed on those projects in the process. Because no matter what else we do here, if we don't have a process to carry out a, a, a review that's that can succeed in approving a project before the applicant goes broke, we can't really do anything at all about housing. So I, I think that we need to get that information on how we failed, and I'm not sure how to do that, but it may work to, um, to uh, have some uh, interns or something go through the city files and see what happened with all of those. But I think we all know some of them, like Russ, you know that one that uh, on the corner of River and uh, Wilcox, is it? Uh, years ago, Brett Brzee wanted to build, I think. It was like 12 units of housing, and we had one that was up on Monroe, and we had another one up on Suncrest. There was a whole bunch of them, but they all failed because of not in my backyard mm -hmm. stuff. And we need to be able to overcome that. I think that, you know, that's a point is well taken. I think that's a great idea. Just off the top of my head, I know that there are several colleges that have, you know, planning or sociology programs that take on dedicated research projects. There's or entities like the Syracuse um, Maxwell School, Syracuse University, that will do survey, you know, design and administer surveys to the community about housing conditions and other things. I think that there certainly exists you know, and should be emphasized an ability to review the city zoning code and look at other types of zoning and land use regulation that makes it makes an easier regulatory environment for a developer to get something built here. Um, you know, and kind of to add on to Commissioner Friedman's point is that there was a um, you know, tons of planning literature that says like, you know, that kind of nimbyism and regulatory roadblocks are like one of the maybe second most powerful barrier to housing development in the country. It's not just here, it's everywhere. So I think that's something that's important and that's something that can be done. Um, 
does any other commissioner have you know ideas about you know uh, about the charge of our commission or what should be done? Uh, I, I know that um, one thing that I don't want to um, you know uh, push uh, commissioner shoot too hard, but I think you know having your expertise and insight into the form based codes and those kind of more architecture based approaches to zoning would be very helpful from you know perspective of an architect. That you know I think. That'd be, I think that'd be very helpful for us and, and educational for us without that kind of background to learn from you. Yeah, I, I, I kind of look at it as one big design problem. A good problem, but you know, it's a design problem. Um, yeah, looking forward to and it. And then also like, you know, I, I think that uh, Commissioner May and Southern and Freeman all have like a lot of background on the building side, you know, what's it like to get a project built in, in the city, you know, I know that um, Hillside Commons, for example, I know uh, Commissioner May has a lot of experience with that project and can maybe discuss some of the barriers to getting that built or some of the challenges and the way things that could be done differently. I think that would be really helpful too. I mean, there's a lot of knowledge within this committee, and then I know that Commissioner Beckinsley from the affordable housing side and the needs assessment side. I know that OFO does the mm -hmm. annual needs assessment, and they're doing the survey right now. So I think just being on top of that as a commission would be really important. And then also, um, you know, I think, you know, going through the city strategic plan with the city administrator would be important too to see, because it discusses a, a developing a comprehensive approach to housing and just trying to figure out what that is and to break that down, down into some sort of manageable bite-sized chunks. And then obviously since um, S Steve is working hard on the form-based code to, you know, closely monitor that with regard to, you know, adding more housing because that's going to be the test case. The form-based code will regulate land use in MU1. It'll guide folks who are trying to do the upper floor renovations and des redesigns of their facades. And we want to see kind of how that works, see how we can um, encourage more housing projects in the, this downtown district. And so it'll be a test case for uh, form-based codes in the entire um, city and so I guess um, I did have a question for everybody about how we want to pursue agenda items for the next meeting um, you know and how that how you guys feel um, about what would you guys recommend as an approach to selecting agenda items and you know having you know discussion topics for future meetings because it's easy just to say oh you know don't go about stuff or, I, I have a request, Judy, um, because I think we need this information to uh, help us prioritize what we're going to be looking at. And that is all of the grants that will be available to the city that are available now or will be, you expect to be available in the next year or two. Because if there's not going to be any grants for something, I don't know that we're going to find anybody that's going to build anything without grants of some sort. So the grant cycle. So I imagine that as we head into, um, you know, the you know November, October, November, December, that we start um, outlining potential CFA targets and start. Now the the grants that I usually have available are for renovations for low or very low income people. So it could be it could be uh, multifamily or single family. Um, I don't really have grants that I can apply to for a developer to build a development. Those are usually like tax credits or funding that they get on their own. They don't get it through the city. But I can give you a list of what's typically available, but it, it won't be for development. It'll be for rehab. I understand. That's good. That would so be that, great. So that's, that's good. And then I think, you know, another idea could be to have various topical presentations from housing service providers in our area. Um, and then even from our region, like outside, there's a lot of interesting housing projects being done in Western New York, um, through in Oswego County, for example. And, you know, we could uh, get some topical presentations going. Um, I think if we're talking about work items, I think looking at the housing plan, which should be our, as a commission, should be our top, um, you know, initial thing to get started and just to review those, figure out and start thinking about what has been done, what hasn't. And I can 
volunteer to create like a master spreadsheet of that, you know, if, and if any other people want to volunteer to work with that, I guess work on that. Um, I'd appreciate help. So Commissioner Shu, yeah. anybody else be interested in help, helping with the spreadsheet? Because I can, because all it would involve right now is pulling the um, recommendations from each document and action items and then creating like a, you know, a framework probably that's all we would do before the next meeting and then we could start asking folks what has been done what hasn't and I'll go through there i'll help with that thank you commissioner benkenstein um are there any other like i guess priority items that you feel that other commissioners feel that should be addressed heading as we you know to get started so we'll do so what i have down is we have that kind of whole housing you know i guess breaking down the issue of housing in Oneonta kind of in a broad like brainstorming session just to see what we know and what we don't know, what our various opinions on housing issues are. Um, setting up the spreadsheet, potentially discussing uh, stuff like a, a bus tour or other topical presentations and outlining folks that would um, be helpful to talk to us, I think. Um, and then, uh, you know, going over maybe the tax um, the tax sale issue with the county um, and kind of how that works. I know that I bet if we were, you know, um, we'd be able to invite the county treasurer to the meeting um, if necessary to kind of discuss the, co the county's approach to foreclosure and then we can kind of reach out to the city attorney to discuss, get some background information. Um, another idea could be, you know, if, would the commissioners feel, um, you know, uh, that it's, a good idea to start reaching out to other like academic institutions for to get interns um, to work on housing issues. Um, I can, you know, if everybody's okay, I can reach out to some, uh, you know, professors and faculty of the different institutions to see if we can get somebody to work on housing po policy issues, like a housing intern. Um, but then the question would be for this, you know, we would work with the city to figure out who would house them and the kind of logistical things about support and. So I know that some universities have stipends for working with small local governments or nonprofits or other things. So we can figure out ways, the logistical pieces, like the position description, but now it would just be, you know, to start the initial dialogues and maybe um, discuss a potential job description for an intern and figure out, you know, kind of the logistical side. Yeah, just to jump in on that, Danny, um when it comes to things like committing staff time or resources or hiring interns and whatnot, it's, it's totally a great idea for you guys to reach out and see what might be available. When you get to the point where you have something that that might take hold, I think I would suggest you, through the commission, funnel that via Scott that as a liaison back to the council as a recommendation that the city maybe consider hiring an intern or whatever it may be. We and then that can come back through me and working with the staff and figure so then, out what's, what's feasible. And so I guess like we can, there's a cost involved. we can reach out and then get a job description and then send it to the council for review and discussion. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And then in general, when you mentioned the strategic plan before, I mean, the way I see commissions in, in general working is through their council liaisons, going back to the council you know, with those recommendations that in a lot of cases will become part of the strategic plan if, if the council supports that. So. So then to that, to that effect, you know, considering, you know, I, um, looking down the road, one of the things that I see, you know, being important is that we will need to be organized somehow with what we're doing because it's like, it, it, the housing is such a broad issue. So like the, it comes into the term of reporting. Does the commission feel that reporting on a certain bait, like a certain time interval to the council is like an effective use of our time just to keep. Or is, do we feel like just kind of having the liaison come and kind of keep track of what we're doing um, is enough? I think that's enough. It's the latter. Okay. Anybody that's else? That's my opinion. Agreed. I think I'm kind of in the I'm kind of in the same boat. Um, there's also the minutes from the commission. I think if there's a specific recommendation that you know that we're making, we would have more detail and submit those through our liaison. So I think as long as you know, maybe at the end of the year we could just 
yeah, have like a packet full of minutes and recommendations if there are any sent out to everybody of all the since that would not require any additional work on our end aside from what we'd already be doing does that make sense I'd like let's see what happens as we go along oh, sounds good what kind of results we come up with councilman risberger um i just want to go back to the the charges of this commission when you were having your discussion earlier um, one of the things i didn't hear brought up that i i would ask you to consider is when you're looking at our like you said our housing issue is is very broad um, there's many different areas and it's not just lack of development um, we have a significantly increased rental population now compared to 30 years ago. And with that comes other issues, concerns, and so on. One of the things I would ask you to consider doing is doing a review of the code office to see whether or not the, the amount of work that they have to do matches with the staffing levels that they have. And if they are not able to keep up with that work, um, putting forward a recommendation um, to the council of what could, needs to be done, in your opinion, um, to help the code office out um, so they can get their job done. I think, I think looking at it from my perspective, it just seems like they've had to spend more and more and more time just on dealing with, with uh, rental properties. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is when we put forward, or when the Hillside Commons project came forward, um, there were going to be 300 fewer students downtown. So we took a step back and wanted to see wh what impact is that going to have on the center city at the time, pulling 300 students out of downtown. And it did have an impact. This year, this year's freshman class at SUNY is down by 500. And the discussions I've had with people that work at SUNY is that they expect next year's class to be larger, but it's not going to be like it has been in the past because more and more students are doing online work instead of actually coming here to, to SUNY. And that's happening everywhere in the country with, with the universities. So we may not see those levels of students um, that we did before the pandemic. That's going to obviously have a, a, an impact on our housing in one to two years probably downtown and i think i think we need to be ready for it i think that's a, a so that's a um great input thank you so i i kind of sussed out two things and you can correct me if i'm wrong so the first is a capacity assessment of the codes office and by extension maybe community development who also deals with housing as well mm -hmm. to figure out what if there are any capacity issues where the bottlenecks are what are the future challenges and maybe future plans for growth of those two departments as they pertain to housing. Um, yeah. and can I, I'm sorry, can I jump in on that sure. one? I, I think maybe the focus in that respect shouldn't be on evaluating um, city staffing levels and offices, but, but evaluating the priorities as far as the whole overall city is concerned. You know, where do we want to strategize? Where do we want to focus our attention? And, what are the issues we're trying to solve and maybe how do we solve them? Sure. So and then maybe. based on that, we can, you know, which is part of my job is to evaluate with our department heads sure. what sort of resources we might need. Okay. So, just so as we, the commission doesn't get too into the weeds. And so, so, so it'd be based in that sense, it'd be like kind of a SWOT analysis for the two departments pertaining to housing. So in that sense, we, if there was a challenge related to capacity, we would note that and then that would go on to kind of like city administrator's office or council to discuss further. Does that make sense or is that something? I guess I, I see it as it, this commission identifying the issues and strategies to address them and then recommending that to the council. And then as the administrator, I work with the departments to see how do we accomplish these yeah. goals. So basically- There's an issue so then we recommend. So then it would just be like an issues assessment essentially. Yeah. Challenges, yeah. opportunities, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Before, uh, before Dick Miller died, when he was um, championing the, uh, the Newman project up on the hill, uh, his, his goal, he said, was to uh, deal with the vacancies that we expected to, to occur in the downtown from reduction in off-campus students. And, and he said what he was planning to do was significantly increase the staffing of the code enforcement office 
so that they would have enough to take care of those problems. That never happened. As far as I know, it, that, that never happened. So the other side of Councilman Risberger's um, input was to discuss the long-term forecast for enrollment in both, co both colleges and how that would affect housing um, broadly within the city. The typical college is losing three to 5% of their enrollment every year. And, and, that's a, and that correlates with the way the population of the United States is going down. So, and because more and more people are electing to have children either later or not have them at all. So then, so then I so think. So that's another issue that's going to be, we're going to be facing here is going to be our population overall. What's not just from colleges, but overall, you know, is our children going to stay here? Are they going to leave? And what's our population? You know, um, I know we've we've been lucky in one way that our population's gone up a couple hundred every now and then, but I think we're going to be on the same plateau where we're going to start going down here shortly yeah. for our population. So that's you know one one thing to look at. The other thing is uh, if you get a chance to look at the housing needs assessment about Segal County, they they lay out a couple things in there some from some recommendations as well as our own comprehensive plan. You know that might help guide guide this as well so i think yeah that spreadsheet would contain the various planning documents and the recommendations therein and to that effect i think we should be conscious that the census data from the 2020 census are going to be released at the end of the month yep. and so maybe we could get somebody from ofo to like present about the data of yep. you know trends i know that megan martin was yep. one of the uh, i think the census administrator for our area through well, you know and then regarding the student population i think it'd be interesting to get a diverse set of opinions and perspectives so maybe working with the town and gown task force to discuss long-term housing needs for a student population too um and see kind of what those challenges are and how we can manu maneuver to address those long term maybe another good source to see to kind of do some planning would be the the uh, Oneonta City School. And what what has their population done? Has it gone up? Has it gone down? Has it stayed about the same? You know, it's going. It's going back up. Is it? So, right. um, uh, is there anybody in the city that um, would be communicating with other similar college towns? If if all college towns are finding a, a drop in enrollment then we're all faced with the same problem of uh, um, um, off-campus housing and what you do with it. Um, is there any, uh, any uh, center for that kind of information? Because maybe there's some genius in Cortland or something that's already figured out how to deal with some of these issues. Not that I'm aware of at the moment, um, but that's something we can look into. I think that I think that would be good to figure out, you know, ways to coordinate with other college towns to kind of share brainstorm solutions. I know that there's a couple, uh, I guess, like a line of academic research around housing called, you know, around the idea of studentification or moreover the re interaction between a city or a town and its student population around housing and kind of has case studies about who did what, how stuff was regulated. I can dig up that paper and send it to everybody. But that kind of provides a couple of helpful case studies. It's like a term coined by researchers in England, actually, who dealt with, um, you know, kind of the tense situations between a city and its student population, and figured out a way, successful ways to deal with it. Um, so I can share some, some of that information. Um, does anybody else have any other ideas that they want to share? Um, Okay, so we can. Oh, uh, Ms. Pangman, go ahead. Um, yeah, one thing I, I didn't mention um, but could relate. Um, we are in the process of doing a Survive and Thrive marketing effort, um, which will be marketing mainly through social media to our alumni to encourage them to come back here to live and work. And we're hoping that that will create some demand for our moderate income housing in the city. And I think that that's something that is very important that we try to figure out how, how can we market demand for our, our housing, whether it's rental housing or single family housing for moderate income families to, to live here. 
and want to move back, want to fix up the houses. That could also suck up some of the college housing. Um, once it becomes vacant, if we have a demand for family housing, that could really help our neighborhoods. So I think that that's a really important thing, not just housing developments and not just rehabs to keep elderly and um, people in poverty in their homes, but family housing for working, working families. Yeah, I think that would be, um, you know, the marketing piece would be really important because I know that we're doing the whole onto something marketing campaign, but I think that marketing our housing stock will be, you know, it will be important. I know, you know, it's too bad Commissioner Fox is in here. I mean, I'd love to pick her brain about that. Um, yeah. So it's happening to some extent. I know like five or six young couples in their 30s that have moved back to Oneana yeah. for quality of life. They were in their in or near a city and they've moved back here because they can work from home or right. and they've bought their homes and yeah. I mean, my, that's an area that can be yeah. my wife and I were the same way we chose to locate in Oneana for quality of life um, uh, quality of life reasons um, okay does anybody else have any other ideas they want to share um, I know we're approaching an hour um, are the if, I, if there are no other ideas, are there any members of the council or public, or I guess, wanting to address us or ask questions? Um, are there any, is there any other additional business that the commission wishes to address? Okay, um, hearing none, is there a um, motion to adjourn? There's no other agenda items. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Okay. Um, all in favor? Say aye. Aye. Okay, we're adjourned.